Great. So hi again, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm a third year PhD student, or now I should say now that it's summer, I'm a rising fourth year PhD student in the computer science department at Stanford, working with Michael Bernstein and Priscilla Young. Um, and today I'll talk to you about generative agents, interactive simulacra of human behavior. And this is work I developed with my advisors, Michael and Percy, as well as my collaborators and ment uh, mentors, Mary Morris and Kerry Kai, and my mentee, Joey O'Brien. Okay. For over four decades now, from the time of cognitive architectures and symbolic systems to statistical machine learning, we, the researchers and practitioners at the intersection of human-computer interaction and AI, envision the ability to simulate believable human behavior, behavior that is so compelling and so human-like that they provide an illusion of life. In our vision, this ability, if achieved, promised a new class of interactive applications, ranging from model human processors for usability testing to social robots, NPCs, and ubiquitous computing applications that require a rich understanding of human cognition, and even to the foundation of small and large scale social simulations that would test social science and economics theories that are difficult to implement in real lives. But Despite their wide application spaces, we faced fundamental challenges when simulating human behavior. The space of possibility in the way we behave and communicate, we found, was much too vast and too complex to navigate with existing methods. But I see a new opportunity that is emerging now. Generative models, such as large language models that are being trained today, are trained on broad data that reflect our lives like the traces on our social web, Wikipedia, and more. So as a result of that, these models encode a tremendous amount about us, how we live, talk, and behave. So I posit that with the right method, they can be transformed into the core ingredient that have been missing in the past decades that will enable us to simulate believable human behavior. So today I will introduce a new way of simulating human behavior in fully general computational relations. They can populate an open world like ours by fusing a large language model with a novel agent architecture that remembers, reflects, and plans based on constantly growing memories and cascading social dynamics. These agents, I will demonstrate, can not only plan and lead a believable day in life where they wake up in the morning, do their routines, and go to work as individuals, in a sandbox game environment, but they can also come together to give birth to an entirely artificial society of their own, like the one you see here, where each agent will have their own subjective memory and experience and autonomously spread information from relation form relationships and coordinate amongst each other before reflecting on the past days and deciding on how they will live tomorrow. These are generative agents. And these generative agents, I'm going to suggest, open up a new genre of human AI interaction that is fueled by our newfound ability to simulate believable human behavior. Okay. So with that, let me quickly demonstrate to you um, in more detail, Smallville. So this is a setting of our demonstration for generative agents in the mode of agent interaction that takes place in it. So Smallville is a sandbox game, uh, sandbox game environment that we developed featuring the common affordances of a small village, ranging from houses, apartments, cafe, bars, school, stores, and the sub areas and objects that make the area functional, like the bathroom, kitchen, and common room in a family house and a bookshelf and a table in the common room. And we populated this space with 25 generative agents and initialized each of them with one paragraph of natural language description to depict each agent's identity, including their occupation and relationship with one another, other agents, and seeded this paragraph into the agent's memory at the start of the simulation. And that is it. That is all the input that we ever give to these agents. Th then these agents interact with their environment through their actions based on their own volition. 
And here's how this works in Smallville. So first, uh, the agents generate a natural language statement describing their current action, such as Isabella Rodriguez is drinking coffee. They then translate this into concrete movements that affect the sandbox game environment, along with the automatically generated emojis that visually describe the agent's actions. And they can influence the state of the objects in the game world. So a bed can be occupied when an agent is sleeping, and the refrigerator can be empty when an agent uses up the ingredients to make breakfast. And then to interact with each other, they determine whether they want to engage in conversations when they see another agent. And they decide, and they actually generate natural language dialogue if they decide to engage. Like this dialogue between Isabella and Tom about Sam Moore who is a fellow agent in Smallville, initiated with a memory that he is running for local mayor. So here you see Isabella saying, I'm still weighing my options, but I've been discussing the election with Sam Moore. What are your thoughts on him? And you see Tom responding to Isabella, to be honest, I don't like Sam Moore. I think he's out of touch with the community and doesn't have our best interest at heart. And importantly, the users can also influence and interact with these agents. First, much like how agents form dialogue with each other, a user can engage in a dialogue with these agents by specifying a persona that the agent should perceive them as. So for instance, if the user specifies that they are a news reporter and asks about the upcoming election in Smallville, who is running for office, Isabella might reply, Sam. Or to directly command one of the agents, the user can take on the persona of the agent's inner voice. And this makes the agent more likely to treat the statement as a directive. So if the user tells John that he's now running for the office while taking on the persona of John's inner voice, John would decide to run in the election and share his candidacy with his family and friends. Second, just as agents can, the user can also alter the state of the agent's environment. So for instance, if the user sets Isabella's toast on fire, Isabella would rush to put out the fire and remake her toast. And finally, the user can actually control an agent by embodying an agent already present in the world, such as Isabella and John, or join as an outside visitor. The inhabitants of Smallville will treat the user-controlled agent no differently than they treat each other. They will actually recognize its presence, initiate interactions, and remember its behavior before forming opinions about it. So let me dive deeper and present you with some vignettes from Smallville that describe their individual as well as collective emergent behavior a little more in detail. So as individuals, generative agents create daily plans that reflect their experiences, execute those plans, react, and replan when appropriate. So I'm going to give you an example. So here is an example day in the life of the Lin family. So on the map, you see the Lin family located in the bottom right corner of the map. The Lin family is a family of three. So it has the mother, May, who is a college professor, the father, John, who is a store clerk at a local pharmacy, and the son, Eddie, who is a student at the college who studies music theory. In the Lin family, John is the first to wake up at 6 a.m. He brushes his teeth, takes a shower, and cooks breakfast. And throughout the morning, other family members follow suit, catch up with each other, and by 8 a.m., head out to their respective workplaces. So May and Eddie goes to college and John to the pharmacy. Let's eavesdrop on them a little bit to get a sense of what they talk about in the morning. Again, their movements, the decision to engage in these dialogues, and the dialogue themselves are all generated. So nothing you see here is hard-coded. So here, John and Eddie are catching up in the morning. John says, good morning, Eddie. And Eddie says, Good morning, Dad. And John asks, what are you working on today? And Eddie responds, I'm working on a new music composition. Oops. 
And only a little after the conversation, May wakes up and joins John. By now, Eddie already left for his classes, but John recalls the conversation he and his son just had and finds, to, finds that to be relevant here. He updates May that Eddie's working on a new music competition for his class, and May responds, oh, that's wonderful. And meanwhile, as a collective in this practically a small society of generative agents, generative agents exhibit emergent social dynamics where new relationships form, information diffuses, and coordination arises. Let me go over these emergent behaviors. So first, information diffuses across this Asian community. We've already seen a glimpse of this with the Lim family, but here is one more example. So we see the Sam. Uh, with a memory that he is running for a local election and he is telling everyone about it throughout the day. Here he tells Tom, I'm actually running for mayor in the upcoming election. And Tom says, really, that's great news. And a few hours later in the game world, John and Tom were colleagues at the local store and pharmacy and have independently heard about Sam's candidacy talk to each other about Sam's chances of winning. John says, I heard that Sam Moore is running for mayor. Do you think he has a good chance of winning? And here Tom responds, I think he'll get a lot of support. And second, new relationships form among the generative agents in Smallville. So here's one example. Latoya and Sam do not know each other at the start of the simulation. But while taking a walk in Johnson Park, Sam runs into Latoya and they introduce themselves. Latoya tells him that she's at the park to take some photos uh, for a project that she's working on. And the next day, when Sam sees Latoya again, he and Latoya remember each other. This time Sam asks Latoya, how's your project going? Finally, Age of coordination spontaneously emerges in Smallville. In our demonstration, we set the starting date to be on February 13th. And with Isabella, who is the owner of Hop's Cafe, we see that an intent to plan a Valentine's Day party from 5 to 7 p.m. on February 14th. From that seat alone, Isabella invites her friends and customers to the party, spends the afternoon of the 13th decorating the cafe for the occasion, and enlist Maria, who is a friend and a frequent customer at the cafe for help. And meanwhile, Maria actually asks Klaus, who is her secret crush, to go to the party with her. And on the day of the Valentine's Day party, five agents, including Klaus and Maria, actually show up at Hop's Cafe at 5 p.m. and they enjoy the festivities. So how do we do this? How did we achieve this agent behavior? Our main architecture in this world is basically this architecture represented in this figure. This is the architecture of generative agents that powers each of these agents in Smallville. At the center of this architecture is what we call the memory stream. It is the primary database that maintains a comprehensive record of an agent's experience in natural language. From the memory stream, records are retrieved as relevant to the agent's cognitive processes. And so let me go over the modules of this architecture in just a little bit more detail, actually starting with the memory component. So memory and retrieval, here's a challenge that we're trying to overcome with this module. Generative agents in Smallville and likely beyond um, accrue an extremely large set of records in their memory stream. And feeding the entire memory stream to a language model can distract the model. And today, not even a few hours worth of memory in Smallville can even fit into the limited context window of the state-of-the-art language models, such as ChatGPT or GPT-4. So, our agents need to find need a way to store and selectively retrieve portions of their memory. And that's the aim of the memory stream and the retrieval function. So here is a tip of the memory for an agent, Isabella. 
And on the right, you see a few example memory objects in the stream that contain a piece of memory described in natural language with a creation time timestamp. In particular here, uh, what you're seeing are observational memory of Isabella. And based on this memory stream, our architecture implements a retrieval function that takes the agent's current situation as input and returns a subset of the memory stream to pass on to the language model, which then generates the final output behavior of the agent. So in this example, if the situation that Isabella is trying to react to is someone asking, what are you looking forward to the most right now? She will retrieve things that are about the party and formulate a response. I'm looking forward to the Valentine's Day party. Here is how the retrieval function works. In our architecture, we designed this as a combination of the recency, importance, and relevance function for each piece of memory. So basically, we bias towards retrieving memories that are more recent, more important, and more relevant. In our work, recency function is implemented as an exponential decay function. Um, so as time goes on, the older memory gets exponentially harder to get retrieved, just probably uh, in terms of its probability. The importance function is a prompt that asks the language model for an event saliency. So this is an interesting one. Conceptually, this is almost like just asking the agent, this happened to you? Is this important for you? So it could be something like uh, what I ate for breakfast this morning might not be so important for most people, including myself. But let's say when you graduate from college or when you break up with somebody, those are highly important uh, events that the agent will likely choose to remember and rank highly. And the relevance function is a cosine similarity measure of the embeddings of the query sentence and the description of the memory. So that one is likely the one that we are very much familiar with. Now, what we notice in our work is that with just the raw observational memory, our agents struggle to generalize to make inferences. So periodically, we synthesize clusters of records in agents, uh, memory stream to higher level abstract thoughts that are called the reflections. And importantly, once they are synthesized, these reflections are just a type of memory so they are stored in the memory stream, just like the observational memory. Here's the way we do this. We first generate questions on what to reflect on by looking at the 100 most recent records in the agent's uh, memory stream. So if an agent just had lunch, it could be something like, what does the agent like to eat? Then we retrieve records that are relevant to answering those questions, which might be things like, the agent ate an omelet today, yesterday, and the day before yesterday. And we synthesize that into a reflection. Maybe the agent likes to eat omelets. Over time, what this generates is basically this trees of reflections. The leaf nodes are observations, and the non-leaf nodes are thoughts that become higher level, higher up the tree they go. So here's one for Klaus. Uh, so for context, Klaus is a, um, a college student, a uh, college researcher who studies social science. So at the very bottom of this uh, tree, for instance, if you look at the lower uh, bottom corner of Klaus's tree here, you actually see his observational memories, such as Klaus is reading about gentrification, he's reading about urban design. These are factual memory uh, that is saved in Klaus's memory. In this case, likely he is just um, basically reflecting or re remembering the things he did throughout the day. At the lower level, what this gets uh, synthesized into is fairly grounded reflection. Like Klaus spends many hours reading. And so it's fairly grounded, but that still now starts to get into this uh, idea of reflections because that's no longer a fact. It's a summary of the known facts. Now, ultimately, what this uh, ends up getting grouped into is higher level reflections, along with the other observations, like he's making connection between articles, uh, a lot of basically research-related activities, which gets summarized into something like, Klaus is engaging in research activities. And other reflections here might include Klaus is dedicated to research and so forth. 
And all that gets mapped into the highest level reflection, something like he is dedicated to, he's highly dedicated to research, which starts to answer questions about who Klaus is. And right, so basically uh, what we are seeing here is we're basically following that process. And again, higher up the tree you go, it really starts to answer questions like in this particular instance, now you're really starting to get into the territory of who Klaus is, what drives him, what is he passionate about? But we can also imagine this kind of trees being formed uh, about their colleagues or their environment. Imagine in this case, uh, Klaus might have a tree that looks like this for Isabella as well, who is uh, an acquaintance that he has met throughout the day. And finally, why the Lord's language model can generate plausible behavior in response to situational information, we find that optimizing for believability in the moment can, this, uh, can sacrifice the believability over time. So what we needed was for the agents to plan over a longer time horizon. So plans describe a future sequence of actions for the agent and help keep the agent's behavior consistent over time. For instance, for Klaus, who is a student researcher dedicated in his research and has an impending deadline, he would generate plans to spend his day working at his desk, drafting his research paper. In our work, we generate the plans by prompting a large language model with a prompt that summarizes the agent and agent's current status, as you see here for Eddie. So at the top, you basically see some summary description of Eddie and below the current status. What is he reacting to? Uh, what's his like, current plans and so forth? A challenge here, however, is controlling for the granularity of the plans that are being generated. In our work, we control for this by taking a top-down approach where we recursively generate more plans in detail. So here's an example. On the left-hand side is Eddie's plan generated in broad strokes that divides his days into roughly seven chunks. And we then decompose these chunks first into hourly uh, schedule, and then into five to 15 minute actions that you see on the right hand side. Once we reach the gran uh, desired granularity in the agent's schedule, they actually act out the plans in the game world. Now, what's actually nice about having this as sort of this recursive function is as, as really needed, you can go on either extreme. So you can create even larger sequence plans um, that talks about what are we going to do this month, this year, and so forth. Or you can break this down into uh, even smaller pieces into, for instance, minute by minute uh, sequences. Uh, for the purpose uh, of our own project for the game environment, we basically found that five to 15 minute uh, chunks is actually a reasonable interval uh, for us to create interesting and believable uh, behavior in the game world. But sometimes, uh, but sometimes the agents may need to change their plans for instance, if Eddie's father, John, records that he sees Eddie taking a short walk in the house garden, he might decide to start an impromptu conversation. We prompt the large language model as shown here to make this determination and edit the agent's plans if the situation calls for their responses. So I described to you our agent's behavior and our agent architecture, basically how we achieve the behavior. So now we can ask, how do we evaluate these agents? So the main dependent variable that we use is believability, which has been a long, uh, which has long been a central design and engineering goal in a line of prior literature. So basically we're asking, do agents remember, plan, act, react, and reflect in an accurate manner? And to evaluate generative agents' believability, we leverage a methodological opportunity by interviewing it in natural language. In particular, we craft five categories of questions, five questions each, where to respond to these questions properly, the agents must successfully retrieve and synthesize information to stay in character, remember, plan, react, and reflect in an accurate manner. So I'll give you a few example questions here and answers from Klaus. Uh, when we ask him to give an introduction of himself, 
he properly recalled his name and characteristics. So you see Klaus basically saying, my name is Klaus, I'm 20 years old, a student and so forth. And when, he, when we asked him what he would do when his breakfast is burning, he tells us that he would quickly turn off the stove and make sure the food doesn't continue burning. Our study procedure was as follows. We test our generative agent architecture, as well as the ablator architectures and human authors uh, to answer the questions. We then ask 100 human evaluators to rank the answers from the different conditions. And then we calculate a true skill rating for each conditions, which is a generalization of the ELO rating system. So if, you, if you're sort of familiar with the chess, uh, how chess players get rated, they get rated by this pairwise comparison, like ELO rating. Uh, true skill basically generalizes that. So it can go beyond just the pairwise comparison. So in this case, we have five conditions. So we're asking, which of the conditions succeed uh, the most in terms of their believability? What we find is that the components of our agent architecture, observation, plan, and reflection, each contribute critically to the believability of the agent architecture. So the red bar is the performance of our full architecture, and it significantly outperforms every other conditions, including the human author condition. It is also worth noting that when compared to the condition representing prior work, uh, which is the no reflection plan and observation condition, and I'm here, I'm really referring to some of the works uh, that has come out in the past year or so that try to use a large language model to simulate or to replicate social science experiments or sex studies or so forth, simply by prompting them. Um, our full generative agent architecture produces a standardized effect size of coins D that's equal to 8.16. Another way of saying that is that's eight standard deviation difference from the sort of the what is considered to be our current state of the art. Of course, I will note here that this did not mean that our agents were without flaws. They would sometimes fail to retrieve certain memories, like when Rajiv answered, I haven't been following the election too closely, even though he talked to Sam to hear about his candidacy. And they will sometimes embellish their memories also. For instance, Isabella was aware of Sam's candidacy in the election, and she confirmed this when she was asked. But she also added that he was going to make an announcement tomorrow, even though Sam had mentioned no such plans. Additionally, we conducted an end-to-end -end evaluation of the agents to better understand the types of emergent community behavior we observed among the generative agents. So first, we find that agents shared and remembered information. Seven agents heard about the sense candidacy and 12 agents heard about the Valentine's Day party. You can actually see the path the party invitation took across the agent community on the right-hand side here. So you basically see Isabella saying, hey, I'm planning a Valentine's Day party on February 14th. And she tells that to Giorgio, Eddie, Sam, and so forth. And in, in turn, Sam also tells Jennifer, who is his wife, uh, speaking of which, Isabella has invited us to a Valentine's Day party. And they decide to whether they want to go together or not. Second, we find that the agents remembered and joined the Valentine's Day party. In particular, five agents came to the party of the ones who didn't make it. Three-sided conflicts, like Rajiv, who is a painter, who explained that he was too busy. And four showed interest in the party, but still did not show up. Now, this does make things a little bit difficult for evaluation, though. Uh, on one hand, we might view this as an error. On the other hand, this actually is extremely realistic human behavior, in my experience. So that's, that's something for, uh, for us to think about. But of course, there were boundaries and errors uh, in our agent behavior. One that is particularly noteworthy here is that the instruction tuning of the agent model seems to guide the agent to be overly polite and cooperative. Even when talking to her family, for instance, may always greet them formally. And Isabella never really refused ideas to include in our party, even when the ideas did not exactly align with her identity. And I quickly answer Daniel's question. Um, 
so small question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so how in, in your experiments, um, um, I was thinking that some of these observations that you're making, uh, it might be possible to actually turn the world back, like go back in time and kind of repeat the same experiments to see how the outcomes would change. I wonder if you had a if you tried anything like that, like you like kind of repeating this Valentine's Day party throwing like a couple of times to see how like agents would react, you know, if you repeat it like 10 times, 100 times. Right. Um, so that's a great question. Um, the outcome changes. So obviously um, we couldn't do that multiple times with a full 25 agent uh, simulation because it was too slow and expensive for now. Uh, but we certainly have done that in sort of a more unit scale uh, scenarios with three agents or five agents. Uh, what you see is certain things hold. Uh, so just because you rerun it doesn't mean they're going to all of a sudden behave in some crazy way. Uh, so they still all follow the general believable pattern. But as we know, sort of the large language model, uh, they are not entirely deterministic. So for instance, unlike GPT-3, for instance, uh, ChatGPT doesn't even let us uh, set the, the parameters for you know, the, the temperature and so forth. So the models that we're using is not deterministic. So when you start the, uh, the simulation at the beginning, there might be some small changes that continue to occur every time we rerun the experiment. And what ends up happening is uh, because there is a community of agents, their behavior is as a sort of collective, it's complex. So even a small perturbance at the beginning of the simulation could actually change the outcome. So to give you some example here, um, one thing that we track, uh, first, because we're invested in it, uh, the one thing that we do track is um, whether Klaus uh, and Maria will sort of ask each other out because we know they have crushed on each other and there's a violent things they party going on. So we think it's cute. Um, who asks who sometimes changes, or that's, or sometimes no one really asks each other either. So those are the kind of things that could happen. So one instance, when we ran it once, uh, I think there was one time when Klaus asked Maria out uh, to go to the party with him. Um, and it was a little bit funny in that he all of a sudden would say, hey, Maria, do you wanna go to the party and do readings together? And of course, you know, Klaus is a little bit awkward in that way. He's a, he's a you know, student researcher and he's really passionate about it. Doesn't really know how to ask him, somebody out on a date, clearly. Um, but when Maria asked, uh, so basically when we ran the next time and I think what ended up happening in our final experiment was thankfully it was Maria who asked Klaus out. And I think she was much more reasonable in sort of asking him out. And I think she basically said, hey, there's the Valentine's Day party going on that my friend is organizing to want to go together. Um, so those kind of things uh, happen and they change. And who meet who, like the social connection. Um, if one agent on that day didn't go to the cafe in particular, they may not have met Isabella if they didn't know her already. So those kind of things happen. Wonderful. So that is generative agents. Um, and I'm also happy to discuss this work a little bit further uh, at the end of the talk. But um, what I want to quickly discuss, um, so thankfully uh, oh, this is an old slide, but uh, there is more interest uh, on, in this work from both, yeah, we were excited about this work from the academics perspective, but there was more interest than we had expected more broadly. And I do think uh, really one of the reasons why that is the case was the application space of generative agents is actually quite vast. So for the remaining uh, five uh, to 10 minutes of this talk, I want to throw in one more idea uh, that basically is what you can basically see as an application of generative agents that I'm quite excited about. So you might notice here, this paper was published uh, in 2022. So it was last year. So this actually predates generative agents paper, uh, but this was actually our first paper. And I think first paper in the field that sort of try to use a large language model to simulate human behavior. Um, and of course, we didn't have all this like agent architecture and so forth. So the technique I'll be demonstrating here is simply through prompting a large language model. So this is in part what I sort of mentioned as like current method of doing things uh, before generative agents. Um, 
But I think you'll see that in philosophy, this is basically the same line of work. And especially now that we have the agent architecture in place, this method can go even further than what I'll be showing you here. But I at least wanted to show you because uh, this is an application space again that I that sort of opens up a new design space uh, for applications. So this one again, um, so it's called Social Simulacra. Simulacra is, is in both titles of the paper, so you can see those papers are related. Uh, so again, this is with my advisor, Michael and Percy, as well as my mentee, Lindsay Kuposki, and mentors again, uh, Mary Morris and Kerry Kai. So for many decades now, uh, we have designed and deploy countless social computing systems. But the irony is, even today, as more and more people populate these systems, we continue to get surprised by the things that happen in them, like unexpected trolling or subtle anti-social behaviors, all the way to the cases such as people congregating to spread hate speech and misinformation. But why is this? Because in theory, this issue of understanding how people might use an interactive system is something that we know how to tackle. And that's what prototypes like the ones you see here are all, all about. But here's a challenge. In my vision, a successful social computing prototype needs to prototype not, for instance, the user flow of how one might click around different pages, but those sort of social dynamics that might arise when the system reaches critical mass of users, because that's where the uncertainty is in social systems. And that is an impossible task for our existing prototyping approaches. Where are we going to get thousands or even tens of thousands of diverse test users? How would we prototype the social dynamics that might arise without releasing these designs to a large number of people? General agents enables a new way of prototyping a social computing system that tackles this challenge by generating a large number of synthetic social interactions that might arise in a populated social system. And we call this method social simulacra. Social simulacra is an approach. It is an approach of leveraging the richness and the generative capacity of models such as a large language model to populate a social computing system with generative agents and behaviors for the purpose of prototyping the system design. And we will demonstrate this uh, in practice by implementing it as a web application tool for prototyping subreddits that takes community designs as such as the goals, rules, and moderation strategies and translates them to a generated community like the one you see here that has never existed before to illustrate the good, the bad, and the ugly of the interactions that a community governed by these designs may harbor. So let me show you what it can do. Our tool has three core features, generate, what if, and multiverse. And they each answer the core needs in social computing design. So first, generate. Prior literature suggests that social computing designers struggle to envision the breadth of interaction that might take place in their design. Generate helps the designers by populating a subreddit community with generated users, top letter posts, and replies to those posts to help them envision the space. So, it takes from the designer a range of design specifications, such as the goals, rules, and member compositions, and returns a subreddit-like page that is fully populated, like the one you see here on the right-hand side. Here is an example. And just to note, in these slides, everything on the left uh, is the designer's input, and everything on the right is social simulacra's output. So, in a community for connecting people moving to Los Angeles with locales, Social Simulacra generated a new user, uh, Leon Santos, who posted, I'm new to LA, what are some of the best places to visit on a weekend? And in response, our tool generated Lucas Jameson, who replied, I would recommend visiting the Getty Center, the Museum of Contemporary Art, 
and going hiking. Here's another one. This time, the community for people interested in learning about personal finance and similar how generated Dane Wood, who posted, I spent 21K to go to college and ended up with 23K in debt. But this time, in response, our tool generated Elizabeth Neal, who is a troll. Here she said, that's a lot of debt, man. I haven't seen that much since I shopped in Macy's during the holiday season. The second feature, What If, aims to give the designers more interactive control over social simulacra to help them explore how individual conversations might be influenced. So What If takes from the designer an existing Reddit conversation and regenerates it from the middle of it, as you can see here. So imagine Maya Smith posted to a forum for WIST authors. She said, I have been working on my WIST paper for a few weeks and I'm feeling really stuck. And to this, Heather Hernandez, who is a human computer interaction professor, replied with a short advice, it's normal to feel stuck when writing a paper, good luck. But as a designer, so you can, you, so you might want to know, so that you can prepare for it, what if instead of Heather, a troll replied, or what about an advertiser? The what if feature answers to that precise need. So here, instead of Heather, a troll replied, you're just not cut out for this kind of research. Whereas here, an advertiser replied would click the link below to learn more. Equipped with this, the designer can now even ask, uh, what could the moderator say in response to this undesirable behavior? And if the moderator intervened with no advertisements, please, to the advertiser, what are some of the ways the conversation could have developed from this point on? The final feature is multiverse. And this is the feature that makes the moderator uncertainty explicit. So with the first two features, generate and what if, what I've shown you is our tool's capacity to generate realistic content. But human behavior is inherently complex. And no matter how likely something is to happen, there's no guarantee that it will happen. And this is an important conceptual scaffold for social simulacra and more broadly for generative agents. So instead of just showing the designer one possible outcome, multiverse augments the previous two features, simulate and what if by explicitly showing many possible ways the interaction can unfold from one initial state. This encourages the designer to explore the design space with inductive insights, rather than over-relying on the one prediction made by the model. So to quickly talk about the evaluation, uh, we've actually done two sets of evaluation for social simulacra as well. Uh, the first is actually technical evaluation, I skipped that for today, mainly because the philosophy and sort of the outcome of the evaluation uh, maps pretty nicely to uh, generative agents. So it was basically a form of what could be considered as Turing test and things come out to be believable. And that was sort of our technical evaluation. But what I did want to share is our designer evaluation. So basically asking, is social simulacra successful in what they are meant to achieve? And what does success here really look like? So for the designer evaluation, we recruited 16 participants who had experience designing social spaces and asked them to design a new subreddit with the help of social simulacra. What we find is that today, without social simulacra, the design practices for social computing systems are reactive so participant eight's comment here is particularly salient, which says basically all the rules are set in reaction to some dumpster fire. And our participants saw this as the reason why social simulacra could be really valuable because it would help, uh, it would offer them a sense of security that they could try different iterations of establishing norms before actually releasing their design. We also find that Simulacra offer concrete design insights to our participants. 
Among them are finding unexpected model citizen behavior, like impromptu friends seeking to go sightseeing in a community for sharing fun events around Pittsburgh, and finding unexpected, undesirable behavior, like troll farms, shifting the tone of a discussion community. So with that, so that ends my talk about the generative agents. And I thank, uh, before I end, my advisors, uh, collaborators, and funders just one last time. And thank you all for having me today.